Well, hello. Uh, welcome to this Department of Physics colloquium, um, both uh, in person and uh, out there. Uh, you're both welcome, both groups. Uh, and I look forward to also welcoming Mellon, who's a former member of the physics department here, received his PhD in 1988. 88. 88. So, uh, on. Before most of them were born. <laughs> before many of you were born. Um, yes, uh, so Mellon got his degree uh, on a neutrino physics experiment yeah. at Bookhaven Lab. Uh, working with Professor Muno. Uh, Bob is here in front, um, and uh, I was um, enjoyed being part of that team as well, uh, looking for elastic neutrino electron scattering uh, at Brookhaven. Um, since then, uh, Millen has continued in neutrino physics. Um, uh, some of us uh, went on from Brookhaven to Fermilab and worked on the Collider experiment there. But the collider, uh, the collider at Fermilab uh, eventually was superseded by the LHC, where those parts of the Brown physics, experimental particle physics group are now working, uh, as you know. Uh, Millen, after graduating from, from here, uh, went to Brookhaven and continued working on neutrino physics uh, and got leadership roles uh, in many projects, and he's going to do a summary of the status of part of the field right now. Um, uh, he eventually uh, led the team that came up with the, with the realization that the future of physics at Fermilab was in the neutrino area with the um, demise of the uh, Fermilab uh, Collider, the future of particle physics cited uh, at ex an accelerator lab in the U.S. belonged to neutrino physics. And uh, Millen's uh, report and his leadership in the formation of a team involving uh, CERN and, and European collaborators as well as U.S. collaborators is now the central project uh, for Fermilab, uh, the Dune experiment. Um, uh, Millen is, as I said, been very active in many areas, and uh, he's going to talk to us today particularly about searches for sterile neutrino and its importance uh, he'll describe. So I welcome Millen today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. In fact, both of you were, I don't know, is that, is this working? Hello? Sh should we turn the gain up? Is there a gain button on this thing? Yeah? It's one reason to use a tie, right? <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. It, everybody can hear me now? Okay. So, in, in fact, both Bob and Dave were my mentors, and uh, uh, it's very important to have kind mentors. Okay. That's rule number one in physics. And uh, if you don't, then do something else. Seriously. <laughs> So their kindness really um, took me through this field. So let me. So what I'm going to do today, um, is this is a rather. Uh, this is going to be a dense lecture, okay? And my, I, I don't intend to talk down. It's 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 going to be full of information. There is going to be a lot of pedagogy, uh, but then after that there will be. You know, latest information for you. Um, it's a review, and uh, I was actually asked to do this review at Stony Brook a few months ago. So this is how it started. In fact, 
I was asked to do this at Irvine several years ago. So that's how it has built up. And um, I have drilled down on many of the key experiments in this, in this business. It is actually a, a, a really active uh, experimental field. Um, there are a lot of references in my talk. And uh, I really would like you to look through them. Some of them are really good. If you are interested in the big picture, um, then I suggest now what happened here. I suggest uh, this review here. This, it's my own review. And it's in the annual reviews. And it's, uh, it's brief. Uh, you can read it. The other one uh, that is uh, quite good is, of course, the PDG. The PDG reviews from last uh, two rounds on neutrinos are really, really extremely good. You know, you, you can read them and you know the whole picture. It's really, they're really extraordinarily well written. Um, <clears throat> something for fun, um, last year um, I wrote a children's article for neutrinos. Okay? And uh, it's a uh, uh, Karen McNulty Walsh is a absolutely terrific um, English science writer. And so I partnered with her. This is the toughest thing I have ever written. Okay? And uh, it has now spread around. My mother has read it. My mother in law has read it. Okay? <laughs> and they really enjoyed it. <laughs> and they have spread it to their <laughs> their friends. Um, so it's it's something fun uh, to read. It's it's a nice introduction. So today I'm going to talk about something called a sterile neutrino, which is a which is a subfield, but of course it's connected to the main field of neutrino physics. I want to thank. Th there is a white paper on this uh, sterile neutrinos, which is referred to here. I want to thank uh, my friends Patrick Huber, Zhao Zhang, who's at Brookhaven, Xin Chan, who's at Brookhaven, and many others. And a lot of the slides in this, some of them are just copies, some of them I, I made myself, OK? So I want to thank all, all of them for that. <clears throat> a lot has been added to the literature in the past couple of years. So this was quite a bit of work uh, to pull all this together. And let's see, I'll, I'll try to. I, I don't have. Uh, I'll, I'll try. I, it has fit in one hour before, so let's uh, let's see how this works. So I'll start with a sort of a joke. Uh, those of you who knew uh, Maurice Goldhaber will know that I'm not making this up. He said this. He said sterile neutrinos are a sterile idea. I, I couldn't have made this up, right? <laughs> if, uh, if, you know him, if you knew him, many of you don't know him, of course. Uh, he's, a, he's, a, um, he's a very important physicist, and you can look him up and see what he did. <clears throat> so the, Maurice, uh, he did not, uh, uh, did not like, um, he had a sharp wit. And his real objection was for experimental evidence that was ambiguous, that, that you couldn't confirm, that it would take decades to confirm. And um, that's, that's the real reason he said this, OK? And uh, others, of course, have benefited from just doing that, you know, pursuing something for decades. So you know, in general, um, a search for a fundamental neutral state is really well justified. I mean, there is no question. Uh, because of it is motivated by, we know that there is the mystery of dark matter. And we also know that there's a lot of unknown things about neutrinos. So it's, it's, it's well justified. <clears throat> Basically, there, there are fundamental fermions that have no electric charge. And maybe they have entirely different interactions. So how well do we really know this particle, which is the most abundant particle, matter particle in the universe, right? I mean, there are lots of them in this room um, from the sun, uh, 10 to the 11 per square centimeter, going through you per second, right? 
So obviously, this uh, this search um, for this uh, this new physics has gotten a new boost because of the discovery of neutrino oscillations, and I'm going to go through it in in just a little bit uh, little bit detail. Uh, at, uh, just to remind you what that discovery was. <clears throat> so the point is, if the known neutrinos, the standard model neutrinos, can mix amongst themselves and they have a tiny non-zero mass, then is it entirely possible that they can mix with a non-standard state, the state that doesn't interact, that we don't know about, uh, and then they will allow us to see that that neutrino that uh, or that uh, neutral state, neutral fermion, that is not part of the pantheon of particle physics. So that is the whole point of looking for this sterile state. So I'm going to look at the, give you the big picture and dig into some of the important experiments in this in this subfield. It, it's despite my attempt, it won't be a comprehensive review but uh, hopefully we can make it informative. So now there is some latest news from Fermilab uh, that some of you may have seen. There is an experiment called Microboon that just announced uh, a new result on this. And I'm just flashing this slide. I'm not going to go through it right now. Um, I, I'm, I'm not a collaborator on Microboon, so you should have a seminar on this. But I am going to show you what they what they have done, uh, and they announced this two weeks ago. So, so we'll just go slip through, uh, you know, step over this, and we'll come back to this. I promise. So, first, we are going to go through uh, some very basics: uh, neutrino detection. So, how do you detect a neutrino in a detector? Well, um, there are three types, and you. I don't know how many of you, most of you have done particle, how many of you have particle physics course? Not you. <laughs> okay, 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 all right. So, so uh, most of you probably know there are these three types of neutrinos, okay? Some of you may not, so this is for, this for you. So there, there is an electron type, oh shoot, a muon type and tau type. What does that mean? What that means is when an electron type neutrino interacts, when it actually hits an atom in the detector, when it comes in, it's invisible. It has no electrical charge, so it doesn't leave any, any ionization, any trace. So it's invisible. It comes in, and in the detector, it converts after interaction to an electron. Okay? The electron mass, if you remember, is about half an MeV. A muon type neutrino, same thing, but it will convert to a muon, which is, which is much heavier, okay, 105 uh, MeV. And a tau type also interacts, but it converts to a tau particle, which is much heavier, 1.8 GeV. This tau particle um, decays fairly quickly, uh, and it decays to hadrons and other other states. So these three interactions are distinguishable from each other by the type of particle that is left behind. And from this type of particle, you can tell what type of neutrino came into your detector. OK? Everybody OK? All right. So there is another type of interaction called neutral current in which the neutrino interacts and leaves elastically. Okay. So this is called a neutral current. It, it, uh, it does not change charge, so the neutrino remains a neutrino. So that's why it's called a neutral current. And these are called charge current. It is the charge current reaction that we are mostly concerned with in these experiments, in which you want to figure out what type of neutrino came in. Okay, And also, you want to measure its energy. And the way you measure its energy is you sum of all the ionization are all the you know uh, all the light that is produced by all these charged particles that were deposited okay now the way you you tell these uh, things apart is an electron has a very different type of signature in a detector than a muon a muon is is a long particle it decays quite late 
it can go make long traces in the detector. An electron is an electromagnetic shower. It becomes a, a showering particle. It looks like a you know, flash of lightning. And a tau, I already told you, it decays to multiple, multiple particles. So, so this is just basics. So, but we're going to get into much more detail soon. <clears throat> Sources. So this uh, picture, I, I made this picture um, for that review uh, in the, so which uh, you can read. Um, uh, in this picture, I have pulled together all the sources of neutrinos from which we have learned about this particle. Okay, so we're going to go through uh, through them one by one. Uh, some of them are natural; others are man-made. So I'll start at the top left here. Uh, a supernova uh, can go off. You know, it usually in our own galaxy, uh, if it goes off in a farther galaxy, we actually our detectors aren't actually big enough to see it in the neighboring galaxy. But for example, one went off in 1987, and we saw a few events. Uh, the neutrinos that come out of a supernova, they come democratically, meaning they populate all the different types, the electron types, muon type, tau types, and also their antineutrinos. Okay, they all come, they all, all six, six types come. Neutrinos come from the sun. The ones that come from the sun are all electron neutrinos, no antineutrinos. Okay? Now I'm going to just give you this information. You can go back, figure out why. Okay. And uh, <clears throat> cosmic rays, uh, cosmic rays. There are high energy particles coming from, you know, outer space. They strike our our atmosphere, and uh, they make showers of mesons, which decay, and they produce atmospheric neutrinos. And they are actually predominantly muon and electron type. It might be extremely rare tau types, but uh, that's very rare. They're predominantly muon electron type. You also have antineutrinos. <clears throat> now we come to the third, um, the, the last natural one is the Earth. The Earth uh, has uh, radioactive decays inside. It's actually in the crust of the Earth. And those are called geoneutrinos. They are all anti-electron type of neutrinos. Okay, they come from the Earth. They're very low energy. Now we come to the man-made ones. These are re nuclear reactors, and we're going to go into a little bit of depth later on nuclear reactors. They produce neutrinos, and they come out from the core um, of the of the reactor. They come in all directions. You know, four pi. And uh, they are all anti-electron neutrinos. Okay, they're not not the sun. They're anti-electron neutrinos, and I'll explain that later. Last one is an accelerator. So what we can do is we can mimic what happens with cosmic rays. We can make high-energy protons. And we can strike a target, producing mesons that decay, and that those decays, of course, we can. We can focus those mesons to some level <clears throat> with uh, magnetic uh, devices, and uh, those decays they will then produce a beam of neutrinos. This beam tends to be predominantly a muon type of neutrino beam. The electron type is suppressed because the the, the muons uh, that come out of it, which decay, are 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 made to stop in a in a in some shielding. So. <clears throat> You can change the, the polarity of these magnetic devices. You can reverse the current, and you can make this an anti-muon type of beam. So you can get a muon and anti-muon. You can select it. You can send it to a detector far away. So this is the, these are the tools that we have. And with these tools, we have learned a lot about neutrinos, which I'm going to get to in a couple of slides, and then we'll dive into and this uh, business of steriles. Okay, so now here is a little bit of quantum mechanics. So uh, some of you must have done this in class. <clears throat> in 
it's a it's a classic two body superposition problem okay so if there are two massive neutrinos let's say and they have mass m1 and mass m2 they may not be the same ones that actually interact and become electrons and muons in your detector the electron neutrino could be a superposition of these two massive neutrinos okay that's like a quantum mechanics it's just same same as uh, atomic transitions where there are two states that mix so there's a mixing matrix it's a simple mixing matrix and in this particular case i made it 2 by 2 so you can now calculate that what is the probability that if i start in one type of neutrino what is the probability that i end up having some probability to be another type okay because remember the phase of the neutrino is changing according to the mass right according to the mass of the well according to the energy uh, because of the uh, because of the hamiltonian but the energy of these two neutrinos is slightly different and so this phase is going to going to change and because of the phase change you can have one convert to another so you can just uh, look at this formula and you find that there is a finite probability that if i start a neutrino in one state I will have a probability that I'll see it in another state after some time t, and you can you can then convert that to length, flight length, in this in this uh, in this way, and these are the two two important formulas, and you can see there are two parameters. One is the difference in the mass squares, and it's called delta m square. You're going to encounter this delta m square now in my talk later. The other one is the mixing this angle theta and so this angle and this delta m square govern this uh, this uh, this oscillation okay everybody with me so far okay. so just some definition so if i start one type of neutrinos let's say muon type and i see if i can see another type which is an electron type that is called appearance that means i'm making a beam type of one one type and i'm going to see another type right i'm going to see if they appear okay the second one is disappearance i'm going to make a beam type of one one type and i'm going to see how many are remaining you know after some after some uh, after some distance or pathways in both cases we have to know how many type a i made and i sent to the far detector and i have to have a precise prediction in the far detector to really know if uh, what I'm getting is is right. In the first case, the appearance case, I also have to know if uh, there are any types of events that will fake that signature. Okay, background. All right. All right. Next. So this is a picture that uh, Boris Kaiser made. So this is a picture with this angle theta equal to 45 degrees and uh, this delta m square set to 0 0.0025 ev square okay that's the unit that is used ev square so <clears throat> what happens if i start a muon neutrino it, i the probability that i see muon neutrinos in the detector at zero distance is 1 if i if i go at some distance with the angle at 45 degrees all of them disappear i don't see any muon neutrinos in the detector which is just astonishing i mean how can that be right so i go a little bit distance more they come back right and i go distance more they disappear right so <clears throat> everything we know about neutrino properties everything every positive thing their small mass their mixing comes from this astonishing effect okay i mean there's nothing nothing like this elsewhere in nature on these these scales all right so now i'm going to go technical on you guys 
So this is a busy and complicated plot. It's a result of after almost 50 years of experiments in this, uh, basically looking at this type of effect, oscillations. Okay, and all the experiments have been plotted on top of each other. This plot was made by Hitoshi. Um, was it made by Hitoshi? Yeah, I didn't put his name there. But it's in the it's in the, it's in the it's in the PDG. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so first, I will start with this plot on this side. This is also a astonishing plot. And this plot was made by um, the E plus E minus experiments at CERN, um, the E plus E minus colliders. And th what this plot shows is a resonance at the Z particle for E plus E minus collisions. And this is the cross section. And you can see this enormous resonance. And you can see these data points, which are tiny, tiny data points. And in fact, the error bars on this are blown up by a factor of 10. OK? So <clears throat> this, this is a spectacular success of, of particle physics to explain this plot. And the three curves are with the assumption of four neutrinos, three neutrinos, and two neutrinos. And you can clearly see that only the three neutrinos fits the data points. And this four neutrinos, two neutrinos is excluded, right? So this is the this is the reason we know that there are. This is the most compelling reason we know there are three active neutrinos. There are three three neutrinos that interact in the normal weak interaction, the radioactivity, and so on, right? Now, when there are three neutrinos. Uh, that means um, perhaps they can mix with each other. Uh, and so there are two, two differences in mass squares, right? I mean, there is right, two independent differences in mass square. So I can, I can try to see if one of them converts to another. <clears throat> and this is a plot of all such data, OK? Um, any neutrino that does not, if there is a fourth neutrino, if there is one outside this three neutrino space, then it did not contribute to this plot, and therefore it is considered sterile. Okay, it may contribute to the to oscillations, but it is not contributing to this plot. All right, so that's the definition what a sterile is. Now, this data set has data from the sun, from reactors, and from accelerators. <clears throat> now, I, I'm not going to go through this whole thing, uh, what, what it is. It's, you, you, have to read the <laughs> you have to read the review. But if you look at it carefully, almost all of it, all of this data says is everything that is to the right-hand side of these colored lines is excluded. And the parameters are, again, the mixing. And the, here, the parameter used is tangent square versus delta m square. What it says is that if there is any kind of large mixing, and, and look at the numbers here. They go, they go over uh, 10 orders of magnitude from 1 EV square down to you know, 10 to the minus 12. So if there is any sizable mixing with a fourth neutrino, with active neutrinos, it is excluded across this entire region. So for less than one EV, a sterile neutrino is actually effectively excluded from the data set that we have. Okay, so below one EV square. And that's explained in this uh, white paper. <clears throat> now, there are cases where if they don't have electroweak coupling, there is, uh, there is some room left. Certainly, very heavy right-handed neutrinos, they would be 10 to the 12 GeV. They're considered natural partners of the left-handed ones, and they're allowed. 
sort of light less than 10 EV could be observable through mixing and that is what I am going to talk about and sort of KEV scale could form dark matter observable through decays in the in the in the universe. If there is a much lighter neutrino than this, then it has to be at a very small mixer and probably excluded anyway. Now, out of this data, there are three points here that are positive evidence and that is on this picture. I am just going to go through it. So, there are three pieces of positive evidence where we have actually seen oscillations. Okay? And this is the, the big change that occurred in the last, I do not know, 25 years. <clears throat> First, there is the oscillations were discovered with the atmospheric neutrinos and they are roughly at 0 0.0025 E v square as I said. Solar neutrinos were seen to be oscillating at a much lower number. And so, the picture that we have of oscillations is given in this in this uh, sort of a plot here. Let us just look at the left hand side. There are three states, three mass states, nu 1, nu 2. Two of them are rather close to each other and they form that solar delta m square which is about 7 and a half 10 to the minus 5 E v square. And then there is a larger step about 2.5 10 to the minus 3 E v square. Now, what do the color bars indicate? The color bars indicate the amount of electron, muon and tau type of neutrino that is contained in each one of these bars. Okay? So, that is the information that, that we now have. The one thing we do not know is whether this it is arranged this way or this way. Okay? So, whether this, this light state is down here or or up here. The other thing we do not know is actually if there is a CP phase and that is the that is the program that Fermilab is going to is, is engaged in in trying to figure that out. <coughs> and if there are any additional neutrinos beyond these three that just do not participate in the weak interactions contribute to this. Okay? So, that is the current picture we have. There is a lot of detail on this. I'm going to not go through it. The the one one thing I want to, to just emphasize, if you like to, these are now fundamental parameters. This mixing, okay? So you you have to have some mnemonic. So I have some mnemonic uh, for the Euler angles of this mixing matrix. Um, uh, there are these three angles. They go pi by four, pi by six, and pi by twenty. <coughs> The current current fit to all of this data actually assumes that unitarity that there are no there is nothing outside these three three neutrinos. What I'm going to do, what we're going to do now is to actually drop that assumption and see what happens when you add a fourth one or a fifth one. Okay, so we're going to we're going to go through that, and then we'll go through the experiments in this in this field. Let's see if we can do it fast. So if you have if you add one more neutrino, sterile neutrino, now it's going to get a little technical, but that's okay. If you add one more sterile neutrino, you of course now have a four by four mixing matrix. You have a extra column, extra row. <coughs> I, I already uh, told you that uh, these uh, generally these ster the active neutrinos are going to have much lower masses. So this effective, so this fourth neutrino is going to be in the, you know, higher than one EV range, um, and so this uh, this becomes an effective again two neutrino system with all the the three of the regular ones down here and a fourth one separated by about one EV. And these oscillations will be at much smaller, uh, what is called L over E, which is about one kilometer, if uh, if the neutrino is about one GeV, right, or one meter if the neutrino is one MeV. So appearance, 
uh, there is again appearance and disappearance. In this regime, the formulas change a little bit. Now, now you have to only worry about this, this delta m square, but it is still a 2 by 2 formula and you have now a different type of effective mixing angle, which, uh, which uh, we are going to uh, explore a little bit. And, uh, and you have uh, again a disappearance formula that is roughly the same, but now the delta m square is this big gap between the regular neutrinos and the fourth one. Now, there are two questions. So, I am going to go through a little more depth in this. There are two questions. First question is, why just one sterile? What happens when I, when I have two sterile neutrinos? There is, and I am going to go into a little bit depth here uh, <clears throat> because of an experimental issue. That experimental issue is, what if I, I see an effect in neutrinos and not in antineutrinos? or vice versa. That is called CP violation and that is actually not allowed if you just have one sterile neutrino. Okay? And the, the reason is the CPT theorem says that the disappearance of neutrinos and antineutrinos must be the same okay? and you can read through that why that is. However, if I just look at a particular appearance channel say muon neutrinos going to electron neutrinos and I take the anti muon neutrino to anti electron neutrino channel. This does not have to be the same, and that is where a CP violation comes in, but this can only happen if there are more than two sterile neutrinos, meaning there are more than two delta m square delta m squares participating. And the reason for this is quantum mechanics. This effect can only happen if there are two pathways. To, to an appearance state. So, for example, one pathway would be direct and other pathway you can mentally imagine is indirect. It goes up and comes down. right? So, these two pathways then interfere with each other and that causes this kind of a CP violation. So, the reason for my little aside on this is, uh, is to explain to you that there is, um, there is no room for CP violation if you just invoke one sterile neutrino. You will have to invoke more than one for this, this kind of a neutrino versus anti-neutrino effect. So, there is a second issue uh, which is more important. Uh, <clears throat> so, for any two flavors, so let us say in the laboratory we, we are going to, uh, so we are going to dive into the experimental program now. So, in the laboratory we can deal with muon and electron neutrino beams. Uh, and I, I, at the end, I will mention the possibility for taus. Uh, in such a case, there are, there are three observables. One observable is you, I make a muon type of neutrino and it converts to an electron. That is called appearance as, uh, as I had explained to you earlier. The, the second type is I make muon type of neutrinos and I try to see how many of them survive. That is called disappearance. right? The third one is I make an electron type of neutrino and I see how many of them survive. Right? It is the electron disappearance. So, I can do all three of these in the lab. I would do the first two with an accelerator beam because that is where, that is how I can make a muon type of neutrino. The third one I can do with reactor neutrinos. Okay? Now, for, for small mixing, this disappearance is going to be simply the same as the, the conversion of uh, one type of neutrino to a sterile neutrino. Now, you can look at these formulas and you can see that there is a relationship between them that uh, you just look at these, uh, these numbers. And uh, if the mixing is reasonably small, I can drop drop this term, and you can I can convert this so that this this appearance mixing sine square two theta mu e is actually equal to the to uh, to these two getting multiplied divided by you know some some factor. So this gives an upper bound uh, after averaging over oscillations. I can see I can make this formula. And this is uh, this is one minus the survival problem. There is a slash here, which you may not see. 
this is a 1 minus the survival probabilities. So the point is the probability of a muon type neutrino converting to an electron type through a sterile neutrino formalism is the same as the, the it has to be less than the, the disappearance of each of these, the probability of disappearance of each of these multiplied together. And there's a, we can argue about this factor of two. <coughs> this is pretty obvious because you can't see something appearing unless the other things disappear. And the, the mathematical formalism behind this is called the Cauchy Schwartz theorem. Formalism really should be the same, although I derive this in a simple way for p plus 1. This is really the same for any number of sterile neutrinos. You can have 15,000, and if it's still Gauchy shots, it can tell you you can't have something appearing unless something is Okay, now I'm going to try it. First one, uh, and so we're going to first look at the direct uh, detection of sterile neutrinos. First one is a, is a little stunning. And it comes from the Kaplan research in recent. Kaplan is a experiment to measure the endpoint of the data decay. And so there, this is their data. This is their only the initial data. These error bars are blown up by a factor of 50. This is extremely precise data. So what you can do is you can fit this endpoint data. Uh, <coughs> this is a, it's fit with this formula. This uh, this this uh, number here, uh, this function here, is the is this function, and uh, it is parameterized by the mass of the neutrino. This particular piece. Uh, m nu is the regular mass of the neutrino. The expectation value of m nu is about 100 of the uh, uh, PD uh, for, for the three neutrinos that we have. Okay? So that goes into this formula. And this is the fourth neutrino. So now, if, if uh, there were a fourth neutrino with uh, about 10 EV and the mixing angle is equal square of 0.01, see a distortion like this in this, uh, in this data set. So this was uh, published and they have made a limit here. Uh, this is the new limit and again this size for the data is that. <coughs> and it is over overlaid with uh, other other uh, indications from anomalies in the neutrino data which you can see in the head in a second. Uh, the reason I'm showing you this is, um, you know, these results can be really unexpected from the data set. They project that as they gather their data, they're basically going to clean out this. It's not an oscillation experiment. It's really amazing. Uh, <coughs> basically, they will provide the best, best limit on sterile neutrinos below Double beta decay mass. So 
uh, you can read this as the as uh, roughly the rate uh, of uh, double data decays in your detector. <coughs> So <clears throat> the point of this is that uh, double beta decay is actually very sensitive. You know this double beta decay. However, if you see uh, you know this double beta decay, it's very difficult to take that data and turn it into a mass of the OK, now I'm going to go through oscillation. oscillation. the status in 1993, and again, uh, some PS3, this is the experiment that we did, Bob myself did, so it's on this plot, and there's this again, the mixing angle versus the identity. 
why we excluded all this region. So this was the status and this reported in this paper. <coughs> After that, we changed in uh, 2015. There was uh, some experiments started reporting anomalies. Okay. And one anomaly in particular has really driven this, this uh, experiment from Los Alamos called LCD. Uh, and it was, it was uh, kind of supported by a formula of experiment mini -boon. It got further supported by some anomalies in reactors, gallium, etc. I'm going to go through this uh, in that much time, but I'll go through this in, uh, as much as I can. This has changed again with the microphone result. <coughs> I'll just remind people what this LSND data looks like. So this is uh, the LSND data, and the blue is the, the excess of electron type of events. This is appearance. They made an muon B, muon neutrino beam, and they look for electrons. So this is the appearance, this anti muon neutrinos converted to an anti electron neutrinos. And so this is an excess that they found, and they actually plotted it in L over E. So the, the excess is about uh, you know, 0.8 in L over E at meters per MeV, and that corresponds to roughly 1 to E squared. <coughs> Mini Boon, which is a formula of experiment, also observed uh, a low energy excess, what they call the low energy excess, and this is their plot. Now remember, look at the number of events. They actually have quite a few events. It's, it's events per MeV, and this, uh, this is about 200 MeV. So there are many, 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 many events. So this is, this is a statistically uh, quite a significant excess. Now this excess doesn't quite match with this uh, in L over E space. And this is an energy, but this was uh, at about 500 meters. So, so this excess, uh, you know, roughly is half at half of the delta m squared. So it, it, it's kind of inconsistent with this. If you make a detailed fit, it, it doesn't quite match. And nevertheless, um, the, this, these are the these are the results. So this is an anti this is in neutrino mode, <coughs> and this is the comparison. So the mini boon data set is in this uh, solid curve, and the LSD is, uh, is this color. And the LSD data points to that as the, as the best value, and the mini boon data set is, is a little inconsistent with both, both, uh, both, uh, both uh, polarities. There is a second anomaly. Uh, there was a uh, solar neutrino experiment using gallium. And uh, this, uh, uh, this, uh, this uh, what they did is, to calibrate the detector, they used a enormous source, uh, a, a source of uh, neutrinos, ammonium carbon. And they counted the neutrinos that came from this source. So these sources are very different. quite possible that we'll never be able to do this again because of the new restrictions on the politics of nuclear <coughs> So anyway, they, they did this and they found that um, that the number of neutrinos they saw uh, is a, it's a, it's a little bit um, suppressed uh, compared to the expectation. Um, and so when they when when they make, when they are, uh, if you make the assumption that that is because some of these neutrinos are disappearing uh, into sterile neutrinos, then you get a plot like this. This is now an allowed region. So this is allowed region around one EV square. This allowed region, uh, and I'll, I'll talk about this, uh, these, uh, these other signals in a second. <coughs> so now this really depends on how well you know the cross section of these electron type uh, uh, neutrinos uh, in, uh, on, uh, <coughs> on your detector, on the So this, this, uh, this uh, has, it, it's getting uh, re-evaluated. So this particular paper, Austin, Austin Salo, is, um, is, uh, 
is uh, really evaluating this. There is also going to be a new experiment in Russia. Maybe only Russians can do this experiment. Uh, it's in the Baksan uh, lab in Russia. Um, so this uh, <coughs> this effect might be. Might be uh, next anomaly is this. Uh, I'll get to this the there is a reactors I told you make anti electron neutrinos, and uh, we have now found oscillations with them. And if you if you um, on this plot are the results of many 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 experiments uh, in terms of the number of events um, from distance of the reactor over the last many many decades. And what what has been found is that there is a slight depletion, about a 6% deficit, with respect to calculation. Now you have to think about this calculation. This calculation is very good. This calculation, firstly, there is a calculation that is based on data, and the data comes from beta decays from these fission products. <coughs> this, this data was re-evaluated so now there have been several re-evaluations. Patrick Miller, uh, Hubert, has uh, redone this uh, again uh, with the ab initial summation, uh, and he continues to find uh, this equation. However, we have found uh, recently that this is quite likely because of uh, the uranium 235 miscalculation. And this is very likely. Because of the way Diabe works, because of the way reactors work, you know exactly how much uranium and plutonium is burning at any area. And you can make a plot like this on the right hand side. What this plot is effectively is the number of neutrinos that are coming from uranium 235 versus number coming from uranium 239. And this is the expectation, this is over. And the measurement is this. So what this is saying is that with respect to expectation, we are seeing less number of U235 and roughly the same from uranium, uh, from plutonium 39. So obviously, sterile neutrinos won't care whether they come from U35 or plutonium 39, and so that that means the calculation is in error. And there are no, and it's not because of the There's another very technical paper which uh, you can go through, and there's a re-evaluation of this um, by this, uh, this gentleman. I can't, I can't go through this in, in great detail, uh, but there is a new spectrometer to measure this, uh, this beta decays. And they probably are concluding that, in fact, uh, the, the original uh, calculation of neutrinos uh, from the act Estimate the, the new calculations are bad. The original ones. Uh, regardless of this, a plethora of experiments uh, have started, uh, and uh, I'm just going to flash this slide and then speak over this because uh, uh, there are many, many experiments in the world, uh, and uh, in reactor experiments to follow follow this uh, this condition to see if it's really good. Uh, the 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 experimental considerations are whether the reactor is a commercial or a research reactor and the size of the core. For a, for a research reactor, it tends to be in the meter long, which is told that there is one down the street. And it's an interaction with the experiment. So there are many reactor experiments. There is one that has there is a, the result is mixed. Uh, there are some experiments are claiming that the signal, others are not. But the result is, is, is a little bit mixed. So I'm going to skip over this and I'm going to come to, um, come to a result that I participated in myself, which is from the Dia Bay experiment. 
Faraday experiment has a, um, a produced a result. Uh, a few, and then I'll put the microphone and then finish. Uh, and this result is uh, that the electron neutrinos uh, are excluded from disappearance over a very, very large region uh, below uh, one e squared. <coughs> The sensitivity is excellent. And uh, the second result is from the Minos experiment, where again, the sensitivity is excellent over a large and similar air banks to region. What we did is we compared two, and this was, uh, this is again going back to the original picture. Uh, if, you, if you see an appearance, uh, it has to have two pieces of disappearance. So when we combine the Minos and the diabate results, we get a, a very, very good exclusion of the of the medicine being in the region. I'm assuming this one the model. And this is really a kind of a, a really solid result that we exclude this, uh, this thing. Now, <coughs> let me just end by talking about the short baseline program at Formula. There is a program at Formula using the liquid argon uh, PPCs, uh, there is the, the booster beam, uh, and there, is, there are three detectors being planned. There's SPMB, microphone. Microphone is running, uh, and uh, there is beakers. The, the masses are, uh, SPMB is about 100 tons, microphone is about 70 tons, and beakers is about 500 tons. And the distances are about 100 meters, 500 meters, and 600 meters. This mini home experiment is actually roughly in the same this, uh, this program, the status of this program is uh, Microphone has reported now an analysis of about one half of the data, and they have not found this low energy exception for the slides. Because the detector is ready and taking data, and work is going on in calibration, noise reduction filter. This SPMD detector is under construction, and the estimate is that they finish in This is the latest result from Microboom. What they did is, if you recall, the is their expectation, the red line, is the expectation that the same excess would persist uh, from minimum. And uh, these error bars are the data, and the green is the fit. So they actually have to have a slight deletion okay, with respect to the, to the, to the regular fit. But you, you can clearly see they exclude the red. And so therefore, they are stating that there is no excess of low energy electron neutrino candidates. And this uh, low energy excess is excluded at p value of 9, 10 to minus 5. <coughs> and the minimum one sigma confidence value is excluded at Sigma. There's also no evidence for enhanced uh, single photon production from neutrino interactions. So it's an important result, and I, I hope you get to see that soon. They have actually done several pieces of analysis to confirm that. One of those analyses, it's a little background, so that this background signal excess, that's how they're made, these bars. These three analyses say there is no excess. This one has some excess, but it's back in the This is the status of the Icarus detector. It will start soon. Now, let me just stop here and talk about some new ideas beyond the neutrinos.
lessons from this entire program that I described, and I'll leave you with uh, another, another sentence from this, uh, which is a very good thing to tell graduate students that we should all work hard. Great. 
<laughs> Not indeed. Thanks, Merlin, for a very nice talk. Um, um, there, maybe it, it's okay. There's a, it's a huge uh, topic, and thanks for summarizing it so well. Um, are there any questions out there on uh, Zoom uh, remotely? Uh, if not, are there any questions uh, from here in the room? Um, yes. I wonder if I lost my microphone. Uh, first, uh, thank you for a very interesting talk. And actually, I don't have much background knowledge about this topic, so my question could be very basic. But when we talk about the mixing angle things, it actually seems like a rotation matrix what we learned yeah. in the class. So it means it's just rotating on the face space. That's right. Then when we saw that, like, muonic neutrino and tau neutrino mixing, it seems like a sine function. Yeah, that's So it means it rotation speed, like angular speed is constant? Yeah, it, it, that's exactly what it is. It, is there any variables that affect on that angular velocity, or is always constant? Uh, it's the, it's the, so, so it's this formula. Yeah. Okay? So, so the formula has, this is the constant, delta m square, okay. and the, this, that oscillation depends on the length over which the neutrino travels, so neutrino. divided by the energy. So the speed of the neutrino is always the same? Yeah, I mean, the, so, so look, at, look at it carefully. So this, it's, it's coming about because of this this phase change between between this neutrino and that neutrino, right? Yep. The energy isn't quite the same, right? Okay. So when when I take the the absolute value squared of this, you can see this is going to lead to a to a to a oscillatory formula. But that theta is always same. So, that, that oh yeah, yeah. This mixing is, mixing is always the same. Always mixing the same. is coming from this. Uh, so oscillation okay. comes from the other. Now, but you bring up an interesting point, which I didn't touch on. You may hear about something called the matter effect. W what is matter effect? Oh, okay. You <laughs> so matter effect is where this, these, these will change depending on the, the density of matter through, through which these neutrinos are going. Okay. So this formula is strictly for vacuum oscillations. Okay? okay. So I, I suggest you explore that because it's a it's a beautiful topic. Okay. okay? And one other question is if, if neutrino is onshore particle then it should be satisfy energy momentum dispersion relation and if right. mass is changing then how does Ah this this is a very very good question, okay? So this formula is wrong. Although so I showed it to you. Which part is wrong? The, this, this whole structure is actually wrong. Okay. Okay? It's meant as a pedagogical exercise. Okay? If you really want to dive deeply into how does this work when the, the particle itself is a, is a um, as, as you said, it's a, um, well, it's a superposition of many, many energies, right? I mean, it's yeah. a, it's a, um, it's a pulse, right? Yeah. So how does this work? This has been explored thoroughly, and there are some, but you have to read the right stuff, right? So I, I, I suggest you read um, uh, stuff written, uh, the papers written by um, Smirnov. Okay, Smirnov, Alexis Smirnov, we, he has resolved this issue, okay? okay? How is it that energy momentum is conserved, and still this, this so it's, oscillation it's actually occurs. conserved? Okay. Okay. And, and maybe last question is, uh, maybe you mentioned shortly, but if we suppose the fourth generation of the neutrino, yeah. is, it, then is there any like counterpart of that? For example, like tau neutrino, electron neutrino it has some kind of part. Aha, aha, aha. So yeah, <laughs> it's a good question. 
though those there is no evidence for such a charged particle right it would have to be a charged particle it would be it would it would stick out like a right yeah. so there is no such evidence so it, it is not necessary you can have a neutral state that is a fourth state it's a fermion that mixes with this and it does not have to have a partner right it is it is allowed um, now the 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 theory behind it whether how it fits in the standard model whether the standard model survives or not is a topic of intense interest amongst the theorists and that is actually explored in this in this paper that i cited uh, this this white paper i see and and when yeah. the introduction of the co uh, talk that was talking about dark matter things so this these things are can be a candidate for that yeah it can be a candidate for uh, okay. it may not explain all of it right maybe dark matter is not a single particle maybe it's really a mix of various things thank you very much yeah. very good questions yes that's helpful for all of us uh, thanks yeah. uh, are there any other questions people would like to ask Oh, Bob, I am in trouble now. <laughs> uh, to reveal my ignorance, <laughs> you uh, spoke earlier about uh, the evidence on double beta decay. In the case of neutrino double de neutrinoless double beta decay, it's, it's always argued that this is the real test of whether the, they are bosons or fermions. Right. If there is a, a serum, you know, yeah, yeah, doesn't that mix the picture somewhat? Yeah, so so that's why I I preface this by saying um, this. Uh, uh, so w when you talk to let's say theorists who have given this great deal of thought they will tell you that a neutral fermion a massless neutral fermion well almost massless neutral fermion it has to be a majorana particle they 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 have in in their minds there is really no room for any other um the and so you dig into them you say why 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 do you say that the answer is because it doesn't have charge right right if it doesn't have charge there is no sense for it to have a dirac characteristic it it should be majorana so the once again i i will quote that that um, that sterile white paper which is actually a really good paper but it's 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 so long you now all these papers are so long so they they when they try to include this sterile state in the standard model it is included as a majorana particle and so that's why it it the they they are uh, so this whole picture comes from comes from that paper and uh, they they make a point that it would really have a big impact on this uh, this uh, this uh, uh, double beta decay search um, unfortunately you cannot go back i mean if you see something you can't say I saw. I really saw a definitive evidence for sterile neutrino. Yeah, Linda, it was just on the micro boon. Is there an uh, explanation for this deficit between 500 and 700? And yeah. So, so um, did you see their seminar? Um, th this deficit, right? so they don't have uh they they um i dug into them to sh to see uh, so they have these three analyses th these four analyses this one is low statistics and background dominated all three of them have this slight deficit right right <clears throat> um so so uh, they made they showed a table the, this uh, shin chan who who is a g great speaker of this for this you should 
invite him to give a seminar. Um, this uh, he he showed a table of the events and the correlation between events. You know how many events are shared between this analysis, this and this, and um, he made he tried to make the point that this deficit is the same as this deficit. But actually, these events are different. So, so I, I don't know. I mean, they, I think they are just beginning to try to figure this out. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. uh, let's uh, uh, stop. Oh, is uh, by the way, the seminar is quite good. You can, uh, yeah, on the web. Yeah. Yeah, I was just wondering. So, what about LSND? It's quite a large excess. What? What's wrong? Did they make a mistake? Is it background? <laughs> I mean, it's a little unsatisfying that you have so many experiments that are all somewhat inconsistent with each other. So you right. don't know who should you trust now. Yeah, it's a good point. I don't know. I don't have an answer. <laughs> That's one of the reasons, you know, I was asked to do this, right? Uh, to uh, pull together uh, a. Uh, a review of what what is what experimentally what is really happening, and I I my conclusion is these three statements. <laughs> right. Okay. Well, let's thank uh, Mellon for very interesting. Thank you very much.